thank you. Yeah, talking of something foreign, I actually am in the United States, even despite the accent. Uh, I've been here 17 years now. So, uh, so now for something completely different. Um, I was asked to give you an overview on some of the work that I do um, in relation to testing ballast water. And so we carry out, we carry out a whole range of shipboard trials. And uh, I'm just going to overview some of the um, treatments that we've actually been testing and also go through some of the uh, tests that we actually do to look at the, uh, the compliance and regulations uh, for this. So I'm at the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science, which is about two hours south of here, um, down in uh, Solomons, Maryland. And uh, I'm actually an academic, I'm an associate professor. And so I'm an environmental or an aquatic toxicologist. So I do a lot of different things um, and uh, mainly focus right now uh, for the last 25 years on looking at the fate and effects of oil and um, dispersants. It's one of my main um, themes, but I also look at uh, disinfection byproducts, desalination plants, and uh, also looking at invasive species. And uh, for this audience, looking at ballast water um, efficacy and residual toxicity. So I'm just going to give you an overview. Um, you all probably aware of invasive species, ballast water, um, a, a touch on the regulations and management and compliance testing, and then go over one case study of um, the shipboard testing that we've done. So I'll overview some of the main tests, but also um, go in detail at a sodium hydroxide test that we, we're um, looking at right now in the Great Lakes. So of course, you know, why are we looking at this? You know, there's many vectors of invasive species uh, introduction, not just ballast water or whole fouling, there's many others. Um, but a major vector is ballast water. And uh, of course that leads to a lot of ecological and economic implications and also uh, even human health issues. So, you know, Notorious example, everybody's seen this, you know, the zebra mussel. Um, this has infest, infested a lot of internal waterways here in the US, um, and it's required a um, huge amount of money in terms of control measures. And it has um, a whole suite of uh, ecological and uh, ec economic impacts in terms of uh, outcompeting native species, fouling native species, impacts on recreation, and also, also infrastructure, um, including uh, pipe clogging. So, of course, you know, all know this. Um, uh, you know, why ballast water is taken up um, to maintain, obviously, structural stability. I'm not going to go, you know all this. Um, and, but in, in the process of um, ballasting and deballasting, of course, organisms can be taken up from one site and moved and released um, at uh, another site. And, you know, this is globally a large amount of uh, water, which is why there's all this interest in the last couple of decades. Now there's a wide range of organisms found in ballast water, all the way from viruses, bacteria, fungi, molds, algae, um, uh, phytoplankton, zooplankton, uh, larval fish even. And so what we're, um, this talk is uh, gonna overview is you know, honing in on you know, why we need this, environmental protection issues, looking at some of the laws and regulations, some of the technical solutions, the main technical ones that are out there right now, and then um, obviously issues in terms of implementation and costs. So there's a number of methods that are out there um, that are looking at uh, preventing uh, introduction. There's really no single management te technique yet that's uh, effective against all types um, of organisms. So there might be um, a combined approach, different methods, maybe more effective. But you know, the problem is this is a global issue. It's uh, difficult to implement, control, regulate. And uh, you know, when you're evaluating treatment options, there's a number of factors that need to be considered, cost, enforcement, effectiveness, risks, for example. You know, just an overview here of just some generic criteria. Obviously, the safety of uh, crew and, and all passengers. Um, if they've got to be effective at removing the target organisms, and I'll talk about what those target um, thresholds are later. It's got to be uh, pretty, relatively easy to use um, and you know, can't interfere with normal ship operations. Obviously, it can't impact the structural integrity of the ship. And you have to give um, consideration for the size, extent of the treatment, the potential damage to the environment if you're looking at residual um, toxicity issues. And then of course the uh, issue in terms of um, complying uh, with uh, the regulations. So some uh, current um, technologies I've just listed here. You know, there's a whole array of technologies from mechanical things like filtration, the physical filters or screens. And the ones in red are ones that I've worked on uh, myself in um, a number of R&D situations. There's a whole suite of chemical agents. These can be chlorine, you know, the things that you would put in your uh, pool or spa, 
chlorine, bromine, chlorine, chlorine dioxide, ozone. There's also um, a vitamin K derivative that I've worked on, which is C-clean, this is Menadio. Um, and then another one, sodium hydroxide, for use specifically in freshwater systems. There's also a whole suite of physical um, options, potentially. Uh, the one I've highlighted there is uh, UV light, but these are things like you know, tank coatings, um, sound, acoustic heat treatment, um, a whole array of potential technologies. Um, so, of course, currently, uh, the uh, guideline is ballast water exchange. Uh, one thing, you know, many voyages are, are too short, there's not applicable for all. Um, and there's uh, two major types, the overflow of the side and the direct pipe discharge. So just uh, some common treatments here. Um, you know, this is a huge, obviously a huge market, so a lot of interest here. Um, and uh, there's numerous options, and these can be both single or combined options, and there's many companies, also testing facilities that are um, looking at these as well. So uh, just an example here, because I've worked on these, are, for example, a hypochlorite generator, and so this kills organisms like with chlorine, just like you would in your pool. You then have to um, uh, then you then you have to neutralize the chlorine before discharge. Another one is a inline uh, fil filtration system and UV. And uh, quite often you would do a filtration and UV going in, and then a UV going out. So it's a double treatment. And then also there's deoxygenation systems as well. So like, the whole point is that you know there's a whole array of systems. And of course, in trying to identify these systems, um, it's uh, challenging, especially for a retrofit. Um, again, you know, you focus on efficacy, but there's a lot of other um, consider efficacy is you know how well it kills organisms, how many organisms it kills, and whether that makes you um, regulatory compliant. Um, and there's no, as I said, no treatment suitable for all. Depends on the size of your ship, your trans trans transport times whether it's freshwater or marine, and then there's other things, pros and cons of different techniques to consider, things like you know, tank corrosion, safety, for example. So the current regulations, I just wanted to touch on those, obviously the IMO. Um, uh, so these are at the global and local scales. So IMO, and then here in the US, the US, US um, Coast Guard and uh, EPA. And so the whole goal is for discharge ballast water, that you have low organism densities in that ballast water you're, you're releasing and also low residual toxicity. And with that, I mean that the water that you've treated can't be toxic to organisms when you uh, release that. So you have to look at those two main things. Again, you know, it's just an overview uh, of uh, common um, the, uh, regulations and just to show you, you know, how it is such a global and even um, local scale, scale. And here, even in the US, you know, different states have um, different regulations. And of course, everybody's now interested in the uh, IMO um, uh, ratification. So the IMO in, in uh, 2004 has the um, compliance testing. And I'm sure you're all aware of that. And of course, with uh, Finland joining um, last September, then now um, it'll go into force 12 months later, and that's September 7th um, of this year. So uh, in terms of what this actually uh, means, uh, and so I'm coming at it from a, a slightly different perspective. Like I said, we do testing, uh, R&D type testing. And uh, so we use, there's a lot of regulations out there where they're using shipboard testing or land-based testing um, protocols. I don't do any land-based testing. I specifically do shipboard testing. And uh, so the regulations are breaking, broken down into three major criteria. So the organism, uh, the greater than 50 micron uh, in size is your, normally your zooplankton. Um, the greater than 10 to less than 50, that's your normally your phytoplankton, your algal species. And then uh, less than 10 microns in size are your bacteria. Um, and uh, these are some indicator bacteria types, specifically um, the gut bacteria, so E. coli, um, also Enterobacteriaceae, and then also Vibrio um, species. So this is just showing you the difference with the uh, regulations, whether it's the, um, excuse me, IMO G8 uh, regulations, um, Coast Guard, or the uh, EPA uh, ETB uh, land-based testing. So these are the things that we have to consider. We have to, when we're testing a system, we have to um, analyze the uptake water so we know the amount of organisms that we have it have in the uptake water. And then, of course, what you're interested in is the discharge. Um, so from compliance testing, it's only the discharge, but when you're actually testing a system, we've got to look at the uptake water 
and um, the treated uh, discharge water. So, of course, you only get to know how well your system worked if you actually had organisms to start with. And so that's why there's guidelines on you, what um, you should have and at what numbers in your uptake water. And uh, there's a other class of bacteria, heterotrophic bacteria. These are just general um, aerobic bacteria. And that is required um, to test in uptake water, but there's actually no specific um, standards or guidelines in discharge water. So, of course, the IMO, and this is the one I'm just going to uh, show you because they're all, you know, there's different nuances with different, um, you know, state versus U.S. Uh, regulations. But the IMO, they're pretty much all the same. They pretty much all um, this. So the three categories again: the uh, zooplankton and the um, compliance uh, regulatory limit is you have to have less than 10 viable cells per cubic meter. Uh, for the algae or, or phytoplankton, less than 10 viable cells per mil. And then for the uh, Vibrio cholera, uh, less than 10 per 100 mil. The uh, other indicator bacteria, E. coli, less than 250 per 100 mil. And e. coli, uh, the Enterobacteriaceae, less than 100 per 100 mil. So those are the actual guidelines, and you'll see that um, propagated through vessel, you know, general permit, also IMO and, and, and Coast Guard, EPA. So how we go out and do this, we basically pick up our lab, drive, um, FedEx, ship, whatever, normally we drive, and uh, meet the ship at whatever location they're at, and uh, carry out our um, uptake uh, samples. They then will, that would, uh, that would be treated at that point, and then we come back later, after a specific time, we might pick them up at another port, and then we will test the discharge water, so we get to see how um, effective that treatment system is. So we do this in a number of different ways. So sometimes it's directly uh, from the ballast tank. This was, um, talking of tight spaces, uh, this was uh, setting up some mesocosm tanks in a conveyor belt um, on a uh, large iron ore ship to test uh, the sodium hydroxide treatment that I'll talk about later. And uh, so uh, we actually used the water that was in one of the ballast, that was put in one of the ballast tanks, and then took that and uh, filled up these uh, 12 to 15 different mesocosms there, and those were essentially what we used to uh, test the system. On the left there, that's how we sample for the zooplankton. All the water drains through a, a plankton net, so it um, collects all of the, uh, the zooplankton. And we also uh, take whole water samples that we can uh, analyze for the algae and the bacteria, but I'll, I'll get at that later. So we've used the ballast tank, filled mesocosms and the conveyor. You can also fill mesocosms on top of a, a ship. So again, this is taken from one of the large uh, ballast tanks and we're testing the system actually uh, on, uh, on board. We've also um, had uh, various ships where we piped directly with the exact ballast tanks. So we pipe directly from the ballast tanks um, and uh, we set up a little sampling port of uh, tanks here. So they have a, a sampling port and the water comes through our system before going um, in, we pump it overboard. Um, and then this is directly down in an entry room and sometimes it's a little challenging to find space for our buckets to work. So wherever their sampling port is, is wherever their sampling port is. Um, it looks like it's a nice big space there, but it really actually isn't. And we're climbing all over pipes and standing on pipes. But you know, this is how we, we sample. So the water goes, water goes in through those plankton nets and then we have a pump at the bottom that pumps it into the, um, their discharge uh, ballast tanks. We also set up containers where we'll actually send um, uh, shipping um, containers with all the required uh, materials out to ships and they'll send us the water and we, we, we test it back in the lab. So we set up a lab and that can be um, uh, anywhere uh, on board the ship um, or uh, in an off-site facility. So we set up uh, our uh, lab to test for the zooplankton, uh, phytoplankton and, and material. Um, so you see it's a no mean feat to set all that up. So here's some of the tests. This is just showing you the tests that we actually use. So again, these keep in mind these are uh, you know, uh, research and development based tests. They're based a lot on the use, U, UPA, uh, EPA ETB uh, protocol. And keep in mind that's a land based test, but uh, we, don't, we don't do this. I mean, we, we're using those protocols for this. But um, the IMO does have shipboard tests that we also work with, and we're also following the uh, vessel general permit um, guidelines as well. So yeah, you'll see that all of these are, are pretty much the same um, 
endpoints and regulatory limits. It's just they, they differ slightly in terms of which protocols you can and, and can't use. So our first criteria is to look at zooplankton. Um, again, these are organisms that are greater than 50 microns in size and how we um, collect them is this plankton net. It has a uh, mesh size of uh, 37 microns, which in diameter is 50 microns. And so we will put all of the water through, a minimum of a ton of water has to go through these. And sometimes if it's a very turbid or uh, environment, we have sometimes we have to keep switching out nets and using multiple ones to be able to get that. So the, the water passes through that, it collects this into this, uh, the bottom there, so it's called a cod end. And then uh, we take that and do uh, immediate manual counts using um, microscopy there. And uh, then you would report the number of live organisms per meter cubed of uh, ballast water. And uh, so uh, to, to sometimes it's a little challenging to find out lives, you'd like poke them and see them move. So it's key in this is that you have to assess live versus dead. I mean, it would be very easy to shove this stuff in alcohol or some preservative and look at it, you know, months later. But we actually have to assess live organisms uh, as opposed to just organisms. Phytoplankton, same sort of thing. This is the phytoplankton expert in the front row here, Celia. She does all of this work. Um, and so this is, again, looking at live um, algal cells. And so uh, fresh samples are taken. And how we do this is that, so these are you know, less than um, 50 microns in size, but greater than 10 microns in size. So we collect um, time or volume integrated samples from the whole deballasting um, of whole water. And uh, that is what's used um, to look at algal cells. So it's key again to look at the, num the number of live phytoplankton. And to do that, there's a whole uh, variety of staining techniques, dual, dual staining, uh, CMFDA, these are stains that will uh, only light up when the algae is live. And um, so that allows you an assessment of the number of live cells, and that's reported as per mill of ballast water. And that's done with a epifluorescent uh, microscopy. Um, and so, uh, you know, this is just showing here vessel general permit uh, in terms of indicator organisms. So the third category is um, bacterial species. And so you can look at total heterotrophic bacteria. You have to look at these, you have to monitor them, but there's actually no um, discharge standard for them. Um, e. coli and enterococci, it's a different, there is actually those um, guidelines, uh, thresholds for those. And there's a variety of different methods that have been approved. This is why I wanted to put this up there. There's just different methods that you can use to look at the same thing. The ones in red are the ones that I use. So for heter heterotrophic bacteria, um, just standard microbial plate clamps. For E. coli, um, IDEX have this great easy to use system. Um, and I'll show you that later. And the same thing for the uh, Enterobacteriaceae. So this is how we test for um, E. coli. Um, so we use uh, the IDEX test and uh, the, I use the Coya 18 specifically. There's two different types. This one just is quicker. It's done in 18 hours as opposed to 24 hours. Really easy to use. You basically take your 100 mils of water if you're in a freshwater environment, if you're in a marine environment, you do have to do a one to 10 dilution. Um, so you just take that um, water, see in the top uh, picture there, you, they have these sterile bottles, you pour um, 100 mils into those sterile bottles, you add this little test packet, and it's in a powder, you just pour it in, you mix it up, uh, let it dissolve, and that is your, actually your growth media and also an indicator. You seal it in this tray, so that bottom uh, second picture in, you just put this, um, it's a, a plastic tray and it basically seals it like an iron, um, seals it shut and the, uh, you can see what the trays look like on the right there. So you incubate it for 24 hours um, at 35 degrees C and you know, this is actually a very common um, technique that's used when I was on some of the ships, especially the cruise lines. This is what they um, test their water. They actually have a lab with an IDEX machine on um, and they will be testing for E. coli and Enterobacteriaceae um, as part of their regulations. Um, on a basically weekly basis. So how um, can you tell if you have um, coliform bacteria? So this is the sort of the parent overview of an E. coli. E. coli is a coliform bacteria, but there's no regulations for coliform. Um, so the coliform uh, shows up as yellow in those wells. So you can you count the number of yellow wells versus clear wells. Um, and then you want to go and put it under UV light. And that tells you how many E. coli you have. So if the well is yellow, meaning coliform, and under UV light it goes blue, um, then that is positive for E. coli. 
you would then count the number of wells, and it's hard to see, but you can see that blue one in the, in the bottom left um, on that um, plate there. So you count them, and then there's what's called this MPN table. So it tells you how many large wells, there's also smalls, how many small wells are positive, and you look across on the grid, and that tells you how many bacteria you have per 100 mil sample. And that's the number that you have to uh, report. Same thing for Enterobacteriaceae. Again, really easy to use, IDEX test. Um, and IDEX actually offer these as a, as a positive negative test as well, but of course we need to quantify, and this is why we do this quantitrate. Um, procedure. Same thing, take your water, mix your powder packet, let it dissolve, incubate for 24 hours at 41 degrees, and you read the plates, this time under a blue light only, and those, those ones that light up blue, you score, refer back to your NPN table, and then that actually gives you, again, the number of Enterobacteriaceae per 100 ml sample. You see this is us, uh, this is us setting up in the various um, sites, um, there's the uh, quantitray there. Um, so, you know, everything we have to maintain sterility and, you know, you have your positive and your negative controls and everything. So the other one, um, again, there's no regulatory discharge standards for this, apart from you actually have to, you actually have to um, measure them. There is some, uh, for testing, we have to know what's in our uptake, but um, not what's in our discharge. So standard method is just standard plate counts. This is, you know, what's used in wastewater treatment plans all the time. So that's that um, round, um, like Petri dish there. That's actually not a solid agar. This is actually a membrane filtration, which is why you can see the picture in the middle. Um, you put your water over one of these filter um, uh, filters, and uh, then you take that filter and put it onto a pad that's soaked in your growth media, and then you grow it. Um, so it's a similar thing, it's still a plate method. Um, problem with those things is that they're solid media, and you know, you're, you're probably only going to get about 0.1% of your bacteria is actually going to grow on uh, a solid media. Um, so, uh, but that is the, uh, the method, uh, for example, that's listed under the BGP um, and uh, ETB methods. Um, and uh, so again, you can do membrane filtration or regular solid media. I do the membrane filtration. Um, so I've also looked at others that, um, because I'm in research, I look at others that are um, alternative um, methods. For example, I'll give you there is a petrofilm plate. This is just like a paper plate. Um, and uh, you, you put in a one mil of your sample, put the uh, plastic down over it, and you have this little plastic thing that makes it into a round circle and that rehydrates your uh, media. So essentially you've got a Petri dish right there, in this little thing. Still takes uh, 24 hours to um, incubate, but you can see those little red dots are telling you um, the number of bacteria. So I've been comparing and contrasting you know, all of these different methods. Um, because obviously you want something that's easy to use. Um, unfortunately for algal growth, you're not going to get something done quickly. It's going to take um, time. But there are other methods in development that I'm happy to talk to you about after this. So again, you'll report these bacteria numbers as colony forming units or minimal problem number. It's the same thing. It's basically the number of you know, bacteria per mil of sample for this because there's so many out there. That's why it's per mil. There's um, alternatives that I've been using. Um, on every trip as well. The IDEX has this um, simplate, you can see on the top there. These are little plastic, they look like petri dishes, they have little holes. Um, and uh, this is an, a, an approved um, system for freshwater in terms of wastewater treatment um, testing. Uh, it's an ASTM uh, method. So you'll see a lot of people that are actually starting to use this when they're doing ballast water um, testing. It's again a UV based um, detection system, 48 hour incubation. And uh, it's uh, been approved because you get pretty similar results to the standard pore plate method. I actually think it's better than the pore plate method um, because you're incubating your bacteria in a liquid media as opposed to a solid media. And I've been getting really good results. So basically you can either count the, the number of wells, there's 72 wells in that. Um, you count the number of positive ones, either from the top, which is that one on the left, or from the bottom, which is the one uh, on the right there. Now the key with any of these heterotrophic tests I've talked to you about, you really have to get your dilution right because there's so many heterotrophic bacteria out there. You know, I will be diluting my samples 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 fold time to get them in the range that I can detect them. So that's, that's one nuance with this. It's you know, not just a quick pour your sample and, and, and read. Um, the other one is the IDEX HP, uh, heterotrophic plate counts. Same as the, with the E. coli and Enterobacteriaceae, it's a tray method. 
And again, you would count the positive of um, wells that light up blue there. So I found those um, to be pretty similar uh, between those methods, but of course the plate one is, a lot, um, is the tray one is a lot easier to use. So, um, you know, the, uh, there's of course a lot of uh, work going in right now in terms of, right now those are the three main um, compliant uh, method, methods and thresholds, the zooplankton, the phytoplankton, and those indicate, indicate, indicator bacteria. Um, and, uh, you know, in future, may need to adopt a, you know, a surrogate type approach. I mean, nobody's going to be sitting there under a microscope counting, believe me, it takes hours. <laughs> And you have to really know your zooplankton. Um, so there's all sorts of you know, handheld kits, all sorts of things that are coming out with that look at you know, ATP generation, which tells you, you know, an organism's alive. It's not gonna tell you which type of organism. There's all sorts of um, chlorophyll detection methods that can be um, surrogate for um, algal cells. And so there's you know, a lot of these um, tools that are in development and we've been uh, looking at them in, in our tests. Um, and uh, so, knows what the future of uh, those will be. Some interesting things that um, just uh, some take home points is that you know, there's some real issues when you're trying to count particularly um, phytoplankton. The, phyto the algae can be you know long strings of single algae and they can break into fragments. They can be you know have a, a, a long size of 50 microns and then a, a, mini a minimum size of five microns. So it's like so, you know, where do you categorize these things when they're all different shapes, um, sizes? Um, and one thing that we've constantly run into every single shipboard test I've done in the last 20 years, um, I get very few phytoplankton or algal species that are in the compliant um, size. So remember for that size, it's greater than 10 microns um, and uh, less than 50. Uh, over 90% of the algae that I see are actually below that um, 10 micron um, fraction. So they're basically not in the regulated um, size category. Um, and uh, there's some uh, issues with uh, how you would actually look at live dead um, organisms. It's a little easier with zooplankton, you can poke them and you can you know, move, they're alive. But for the algae, it's a lot more challenging and there's a lot of controversy over the use of these staining um, techniques. Um, there's new techniques being developed, for example, the MPN um, method, which basically looks at growth over the time, just like with the bacteria tests. Um, and so, again, there's still a lot of development in terms of these specific tests. So the other side, just flipping to the other side, um, as well as looking at the efficacy, so how well your system would, would kill organisms, you have to give some um, consideration for, well, does that treatment to kill organisms, if you release it, is it going to kill organisms out in the um, receiving waters, and of course that, you know, you can't do that. So um, the discharge water, you test for residual, what's called residual toxicity, and uh, you do that by a, a whole effluent toxicity test. So this is, you know, your EPA standard, you know, MPDS permit um, test. It doesn't tell you what is killing an organism, it just tells you that that effluent is toxic for some reason. And there's three main organisms that are used, um, invertebrates, things like the uh, sea dubia, it's a uh, it'll, um, water flea. You look at um, larval fish as your vertebrate species, um, fathead minnow is an example. Um, you'd also, this is for fresh water, there's different species when you're looking at estuarine and um, salt water systems. And then green algae, so you can use any one of those. Um, normally you would use at least two. So this is what a wet test looks like. Um, you would have your water, you have to, um, to get a dose response curve, um, then instead of, you know, no, you don't know what chemical, chemical you have, so you do a dilution series of your, of your discharge water to come up with that concentration curve. So your, your neat ballast water is 100%, excuse me, you, you dilute it with control water 50%, so, you know, and, and you work down to 6%. So you do, so you see there's thousands of different beakers, and uh, ultimately you look at two main endpoints, um, the uh, concentration that, the, or the dilution that would kill 50% of your organism. So that's a, a, an acute test, you report LC50s, or you can do a chronic based test. And these are also in the um, IMO, uh, uh, the G, G9 and the uh, vessel general permits. So I just wanted to show you some of the, um, testing trials um, that we've done recently, um, specifically focus on one. Again, these, keep in mind, these are, you know, R&D based. We also do step compliance testing as well. 
Um, we've we've uh, been on board various ships, uh, both marine and freshwater ships, a whole variety of um, test, uh, test systems, UV filtration, UV filtration in parallel, chlorine, whether, there's, whether that's direct chlorination or electric chlorination, um, sodium hydroxide was a relatively new one recently, ozone bromine, and also that menadione as well. So we've had a lot of different interesting locations within ships to be working in. Um, and so the uh, lead for this work, um, so I said I'm an um, associate professor at the University of Maryland, so I do um, some work through there, but also uh, with a consulting company, um, Environmental Research Services, which is um, headed by Dr. David Wright, it's his company. And uh, so it's him and myself and Celia and a whole array of other staff. Uh, Greg is the one in the, in the yellow there. And so we basically get on board a ship and, and, and do the testing. Uh, again, we have all our own um, equipment. We take it on, on board the ship or, or at an offsite um, facility close by. We will take up that uptake water and then we will look at the um, discharge water for all of those different parameters I just discussed. So I just wanted to show you this um, sodium hydroxide one because you know when I heard about sodium hydroxide as a treatment system, the first thing is a, a but I'm like, oh wow, that's not going to do good for your, your, your tanks. But <laughs> actually, it's the complete opposite. I'm not the chemist, but um, it's actually uh, pretty anti-corrosive apparently. But this is a new system; it can only be used for um, uh, fresh water. It won't work in a in a saline environment. But this was um, a proposal to uh, look at the uh, sodium hydroxide as a ballast water treatment. And so we were looking on board, we did five trials on board to look at the efficacy and residual toxicity of this method, specifically for freshwater bulk freighters. Again, this was in um, collaboration with a lot of different people, um, Dave Wright, Nick Walshmeyer, um, colleagues at USGS, um, and uh, it was uh, run with the American um, steamship uh, company uh, ships. So, of course, you all know the problem, the spread of invasive species in the Great Lakes. It's probably seemed pretty minor compared to global um, transport of invasive species. And the primary route is uh, through uh, the St. Lawrence Seaway, ballast water. But of course, there is this secondary um, transport, which is via, we're looking at the bulk uh, water from these um, uh, lakers. So basically the goal uh, was to support the US EPA restoration initiative in terms of preventing and controlling invasive species uh, released to the Great Lakes. So our whole goal is to, for this ballast water treatment, is has to meet these two major criteria, um, you know, reducing the density of organisms in the ballast water, and that's what we term by efficacy, you know, killing organisms, we have to have high efficacy, we have to meet those regulatory threshold compliance levels. But in doing so, you also have to have very little or no effect on organisms in that receiving water, and that's termed low residual toxicity. Right, currently, uh, Lakers are exempt from meeting ballast water criteria for now. Uh, that could change. Sure. So. You're talking Lakers, you talking international uh, ship tenor, or just the ships that transit on the lake? Just the ships that transit on the lake. Okay, there, was some, there was some discussion that even I had with allowing international ships into the cargo system and transfer from water and stuff. I don't know whether that was being still in consideration or not. So. I have no idea about this, but yeah, sorry, I don't know that. But um, yeah, we're looking at this specifically for those lakers that just go throughout the Great Lakes. Um, and of course, that makes them a very unique vessel uh, in, in their own right. I mean, being solely freshwater and huge. Um, they have uh, huge amounts of uh, ballast water and the flow rates are extremely high. So this is where you, know, you already can rule out a lot of different technologies just from that alone. Um, they have you know, large volumes. They also have very short transit times. So if you were gonna use something like a biocide, it might not work in time. Generally, um, you know, your maximum of two days are their transit times that we've done. The ballast water tanks are also not coated. coated. So you know, anything that's like chlorine or whatever is not gonna be good for these tanks. Um, and also, I've witnessed this firsthand, have a very high sediment load, organic load. And so if you're gonna be using something like a UV treatment, you know, that makes that uh, a little bit more challenging um, because of the um, turbidity there. So you know, these pose are quite a challenge in terms of trying to find a system. And so um, the company's being very proactive in trying to uh, develop these. Um, and so, our, our, you know, our, our question is, does a sodium hydroxide 
um, system meet the discharge criteria? And again, we're looking at the IMO, Coast Guard, EPA um, criteria. Again, do we reduce the organisms to that threshold? Um, so do, is this a very high efficient system? Um, and we also have to have no or little toxicity to those receiving um, waters. And so this is um, how you, this is, uh, so uh, you're taking your ballast water with all your organisms, you treat it with sodium hydroxide, which highers the pH. Um, then uh, you uh, let it sit for whatever your transit time is. We use 48 hours. Um, and uh, you then neutralize with carbon dioxide. And so this can be from the ship's exhaust, for example. And then you release that water, and you know, there should be very few organisms um, in that released water. So the sodium hydroxide, it dissolves um, completely, you know, byproducts. The elevated pH can be neutralized with carbon dioxide. And again, we used, um, we actually, for the mesocosm test that we did, we direct used, we actually used um, carbon dioxide from cylinders, but there's been other shipboard trials um, and development of this that have used um, exhaust systems. Um, and uh, we've seen that the uh, efficacy happens pretty quick, way less than 24 hours. Um, and uh, by carrying out a whole slew of wet tests, there's no observed toxicity of the released ballast water, whether that's an acute or a chronic test. So just to uh, show you here, so you can take up the water, the water goes into the, one of the main ballast tanks. We use that ballast tank to then fill all our mesocosms. We have 15 different mesocosms, mesocosms you can see in the conveyor belt there. So as they are unloading. So it's really dusty and noisy down there. It's really interesting to work down there. Um, and uh, so we, we fill and that is what we call our uptake water. So we then test that water for um, all the different organisms that are in it. So we know what our starting point was. Um, we then add the um, sodium hydroxide and we have our, our treatment system was controlled just to see you know, what sitting organisms just in a conveyor belt does to them. That's our control. Uh, low sodium hydroxide treatment, a high sodium hydroxide treatment. Um, we held it for two days. The transit time on the ship that I was on was around, around three days. So um, we, we decided on two days. You then neutralize um, to the, back to the pH that was, it was originally. And then we analyzed for organism density and residual toxicity after that. So this is just showing you, you're not uh, probably interested in uptake results, but um, you know, when we're doing these testing, this is what we have to comply with. Like I said, there are some minimum thresholds that you need for numbers of organisms, whether it's IMO, um, the GA, or the, um, which is a shipboard test, which is exactly what we're doing. But because there's not much out there, we also comply with the land-based tests, even though that's not what we're doing. So we're looking at the ETB guidelines as well. So a little, you know, some differences between the two. Um, but these are uptake water samples. I'm just showing you four of the five trials. And uh, for the most part, they met those uptake criteria. It is really hard to do that, especially for the zooplankton. So the zooplankton is that bottom one. It's actually really hard to get those numbers and the phytoplankton even harder. Um, so it's just another nuance with these regulations. I think on over 30 tests that I've gone, I think we probably met the uptake criteria only a handful of time. Um, this was great in the freshwater system and marine systems it very rarely happens. So just the key is that our uptake water meant most of the challenge water criteria for organism um, densities. Um, and, uh, oops. and so this is the, uh, again, the same data, the zooplankton on top, the uh, phytoplankton, but the, this also includes the bacteria at the bottom here. So what are numbers of E. coli, enterococci and vibrio? Um, you can see, we, I've, I've never seen vibrio in any test I've ever done, I've never seen vibrio. Um, but E. coli and enterobacteria, you commonly get this, you know, very low levels, which is way below what their IMO shipboard guidelines are. So you can see those are, you know, 2,500, 1,010, and we're nowhere um, near that. Heterotrophs, like I said, this is all bacteria class heterotrophs. And uh, we, met, we met the guideline for two out of the um, four. But again, you know, this is really hard to meet as well. So this is what you want to know, our discharge water. So um, these are the um, compliance um, levels that are listed here, the IMO shipboard. So the zooplankton, less than 10 organisms per meter cubed, the phytoplankton algae, uh, there's the one below it, less than 10, 
um, per mil, and then the indicator bacteria, less than 250 per 100 mil, and then the entropy less than uh, 100 uh, per, mil, per 100 mil. And you see, for the most part, we met all of those criteria. This test was highly effective in killing zooplankton, and phytoplankton, and the bacteria. The one in red is just the low, one of the triplicated, triplicated um, tanks in the low didn't quite meet that 10 criteria, but for the most part, highly effective, whether it was low or high uh, pH. And same with the uh, heterotrophs, we see very few left um, at the end of that test compared to the ten, you know, thousands and tens of thousands that we had initially. And then um, looking at residual toxicity, um, this is a, so this is, a, you know, an example, this is not a regulated um, test, it's not a wet test. This is a, a quick light system, it's using bio, uh, bioluminescent um, dinoflagellates. It's a, it's, a, it's a kit that's a quick test kit to see if you have any residual toxicity. So I just want to bring this up because you can see people are trying to develop these um, tools so you don't have to sit there for seven days to do a standard lab-based um, wet test. So we, we use this kit and uh, basically show that in all of our four trials, we only yet assessed the high sodium hydroxide treatment. They were all um, healthy. So there was no evidence of residual toxicity in our discharge. But we followed it up with the proper test. These take weeks and a lot of, a lot of people and uh, using uh, the uh, invertebrates and also the fish and looking at, uh, these are chronic tests. And so they carry out for, seven days and this is a more what's the word a more conservative test um so an acute test will tend to give you a value that's uh, that's higher a, a chronic test you know you need less of something to impact that so this is why it's a more conservative test so we looked at the chronic um test and this is actually what's in the um, regulations um and looked at survival and reproduction and passed all of them uh, with the discharge and even with the uh, algae uh, as well so take home message that you know, the high, even at the high sodium hydroxide, it met the discharge toxicity criteria um, for uh, this system. So, take home message. Oh, yes. You're speaking way above my pay grade, but my question, I guess, is when you do these tests for Dallas Fort Worth ship, it's, it's transcontinental, it's come from China, or it's come from some other place. Do you, how are these ships chosen for the test? Random? Do they know they're going to get tested? No, this is actually um, either, two reasons. Either the actual shipping company or whatever company actually wants to do the R&D themselves to try, because, you know, they know this is coming down the line and they want to try and see what test system that would be um, suitable for them. So this, like I said, this is all research and development. They, we also did some um, step test compliance with them to look at their system they have. Or it can come the other way from the actual development developers of the treatment system that they want to know how well their system works and they'll they'll you know work put it on a ship and we'll test it so what, i guess my question is what's to prevent them from doing balance for change out right offshore what? And, and blowing all these all these uh you know these invertebrates and collar all this stuff that comes from far country blowing it off offshore and pumping in local water that's it's going to be tested a lot, supposedly or hopefully a lot. Well, I mean, that's what yeah, that what they do right now with ballast water exchange. Um, and so, I mean, so, but they, but you're talking about them doing it just before. I mean, I don't know, you guys, the other shipping people, I mean. No, I was just wondering, just wondering what makes you test. You're testing this after the treatment system. Right, yes, yeah. Yeah, this is all after, after the treatment system, just to see how effective that treatment system is. But, you know, I wouldn't, you know, the whole reason for doing that mid-ocean exchange that they do right now is because generally, you know, when you're um, discharging cargo of, and, and um, taking in uh, water, you're at uh, uh, a coastal estuarine system. There's generally a lot more organisms um, per cubic meter than if you're out in the open ocean. So that's why you do this. And also, you know, potentially a change in salinity, temperature, um, can actually kill organisms as well um, but so you wouldn't want to you, you wouldn't do an exchange close to shore because we're picking up more organisms potentially so I think I'll make a movie about that and we'll put heat in these things and all these critters will come out is the whole purpose of this is that exchange mid-ocean 
change is not effective or it's just not being done? I don't know, but it wouldn't be. I mean, there's still organisms out there. I don't know how effective it is. Also, um, you know, there's, the, I, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a ship operator, but, you know, that takes time. Um, there's been problems with people not doing it correctly and <laughs> flipping the ship. So, well, if you pick up, if you do a proper balanced mm -hmm. water exchange and you pick up seawater and you discharge it, whatever organ organs that organisms were in it out there, they're not going to survive in fresh water. No, nope, but the majority don't. Then why, why are you doing this? But some will, and that's the key. The ones that will are the problem. And yes. And yep. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, but then, but. Uh, but like, I mean, there's still some organisms way more than what would meet those criteria. So releasing one organism is... And, and then with this treatment system and your tests have caught zebra mussel larvae? Yep. And would it have killed them? Well, we look at, we, well, I mean, we look at, um, when we're looking under the microscope, we will actually categorize what, what organisms we have there. Zebra mussel was actually one that was, we, could, we could see um, all sorts of other, you know, uh, zooplankton. You don't need that taxonomic identification for compliance. You just need to know number of organisms. But yeah, we've seen, we've seen everything. Uh, and what if zebra mussels came in fully developed above your 50 years, above the size? Well, no, they're all captured. So the, in the plankton net, anything above 50 is well, captured. If they came in and the hull. Oh, if they attach to the hull? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's nothing to do with us. We just test ballast water. Right. So yeah. what about all those organisms attached to the ship's hull? Oh, yeah, that's another, that's a, another whole vector. Yep, right yeah. there. Yep. Then my last question, do you have a feel for when the Coast Guard is going to start enforcing this? It's certainly not September 7th, 2017. No, no, no. I, I have no idea. And uh, I, I pretty much stay out of the regulatory uh, uh, discussions. It just filters down the case. So I, like I said, I mainly do the R&D on the science side. But it's still an R&D. And once everybody agrees as which system works, then manufacturers are going to have to start building. Well, the key, well, also keep in mind when you say what system works, what system works for one ship doesn't necessarily mean what system works for another ship. And so, you know, there's, there's, and that's why I try to show you there's all these different technologies out there and the systems, you know, and they're going through, some of these are going through tripe approval. So that's what that land-based test is. I don't do, um, to do those, you know, approvals. And then, you know, then a number of those then can then go forward. So, you know, the major ones are that, you know, the filtration UV, chlorination, but, but like I said, no single treatment is going to be suitable for every ship. So, yeah. So to say we're years away from the actual <laughs> installation. Uh, I have no idea. Like I say, I stay, I stay out of that. But yeah, I, I suspect it will be a while. Have you thought about making a liquor still? Making a what? A liquor still. <laughs> Think about this. If you can decant the water using the ship's water system to, to steam or heat the water, which will kill purify the water, just like you make liquor. Mm -hmm. You take that water, you reverse it, and it'll take out the impurities in the water. So you're basically talking about heating the ballast water? Yeah, heating the ballast water through a treatment system just as if you're making liquor. Right. Well, the problem is the volumes of ballast water in these things, and the energy... Sorry? You have a lot of water that's circulating through these systems anyway. Oh, you mean to the, to marry it up to go along alongside that? But the problem is, is your, I mean, your heat transfer. I mean, as far as some of these ships, I mean, the sheer volume of water that they're putting out, the speed of discharge as well, it's not gonna, and then you've got to think about discharging heat. You can't do that because that'll kill all organisms, all organisms. that'll kill organisms itself. Heat is a pollute. I mean, I, I'm a toxicologist. I think of pollution, not just chemicals, but pollution can be, um, you know, Changing in salinity, changing in heat, that'll kill organisms too. So that's just look, something to keep in mind. Um, but it's, been, it is, it's something that's being looked at and it might be suitable for some you know, classes of ships.
Um, so basically, I just wanted to show you this because it was just a you know example of one that we're uh, researching and developing right now. But again, it's very this is very um, uh, focused on these Great Lakers and in the and, and in the freshwater environments. So back to that point, the smaller clubs, clubs and barges are going to have to start managing or treating their dead water, rainwater, discharge water, and all that, so that the state and those systems. Work because they, you know, they don't have the hundreds of thousands, like two hundred, yeah, whatever, yeah, yeah, you know, cubic meters of water. For instance, I mean, they're probably you know maybe five or six hundred gallons. You know, you, so you can treat that type of stuff, and it would not have a, a detrimental impact on the local system because they can be treated as they're on the way in a right. Yeah, I mean, like I said, there's a lot of different, I mean, and, and for the smaller ships, UV filtration, chlorination, like they do with, you know, drinking water, those are some... Um, six, seven, ships there. Right. Carolina boys don't want to visit Carolina I'm all for that. If you can find a way to make it simple, you can ask So, well, I uh, hope that was something completely different for the end of the day. So um, I'm happy to take any questions. Um, and uh, thank you for your time. Sorry? Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you. Randy, thank you for your help. Good job. Randy, thank you for your help getting me on this morning. I appreciate it very much. Bye bye. Be good. Just before you all go, guys, can I just thank you all for coming? It's been great. Um, uh, I'm delighted to have been here, actually, and I'll be, I'll be back next time because it's, it's really good to see what happens over here. Same kind of set of problems that we have in the UK and elsewhere in the world. But um, <laughs> And thank you guys online as well. Much appreciated. I'm going to end the meeting now, so uh, good, to, good to see you. Join us again another time. Thank you. Okay.